Thank Hello, you. everyone. For those of you joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be electromagnetic spectrum, salsa, and pore allocation in Chile. I'm going to turn it over to Diego to introduce yourself, and you may begin your session. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this session. I am Diego Pardo. I am from Chile. I am a professor at the law school of the University of Chile. Uh, and I also have the privilege of sharing a board of, uh, of our think tank, Espacio Público, with Andrea, which is um, who is going to give you this uh, very interesting talk. Um, it is, I mean, Andrea, oh, in, uh, Andrea has a very long and extended and uh, very remarkable academic career and uh, professional career. Uh, she is, of course, um, alumnus of the Chicago School of Economics. Um, but if, and she has um, occupied many uh, academic positions and professional positions. But I think I can uh, summarize why Andrea is considered to be one of the sharpest regulatory minds in, in, in Chile with this uh, story, which won't be long, but I will, I will make it short. So uh, probably you guys don't know much about a Chilean antitrust court, but um, Andrea was um, justice of the antitrust court for around 10 years but not any in 10 years. So the uh, Chilean antitrust court is a very peculiar uh, court. Uh, if you compare it the, with, with other courts in the world in, in, the, in the sense that it, it has both economists and lawyers in, uh, sitting in the bench. And, uh, and it, it was a quite a bold institutional design back in the days and in, in it was created. And as any bold ideas, you better got it right because otherwise the criticism is gonna be really harsh. So Andrea was one of the first economists that sit in the, in the, in the antitrust Chilean court. And nowadays the Chilean antitrust courts is one of the best uh, well-established courts in Latin America and has a very strong reputation. In, in Chile, and uh, that's one of, uh, of the many achievements of Andrea uh, in, in my mind's eye to uh, being able to forge that uh, institutional capacity. And that's something that uh, I think uh, generally Chilean competition has to um, acknowledge. So uh, with that being said, I just gonna shut up and pass the word to Andrea who's gonna talk about electromagnetic spectrum and the way it is allocated in Chile and how we can improve it with these um, radical ideas that she has. Okay. Yeah, the ideas are not mine. The ideas are Glenn's and, um, and Professor Posner, of course. But as uh, Diego said, I was a judge in the competition tribunal for 10 years. And I saw, and I, 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 it was always in my mind, you know, trying to get a solution for this uh, public, national goods of public use. That's how we, we call it in Chile, or in, in public assets. And how firms, private firms, were not only profiting of the use of these goods that belong of to all of us, that's the definition of public assets, but not only they were profiting out of them without paying us any rent, but they were getting monopoly power out of them. So they were changing high prices using an input that was ours, the consumers or the, the citizens of the, of the country. So when this book, uh, The Radical Markets, uh, arrived to my hands, it was like really a, a very emotional moment for me in my career. Um, so, 
Oh, oh, this is not moving. Ah, okay, yes, it will. So the original idea in the book was called cost, common ownership, self assessed tax. It's called Harberger Tax Two, And it's very interesting that uh, Professor Harberger first talked about this, this idea in Chile in 1962. Nothing has happened since, but it, it, it is interesting. Uh, since everybody has read the book, I assume everybody understands it, but I'm gonna explain it very shortly anyway. Uh, cost is a self-assessed tax. What means self-assess is that the government or, uh, fixes a tax rate, but it doesn't fix the base on what this tax is gonna be applied to, but it asks you, the owner, to quote uh, what's the price, so you would have to pay uh, that value that you quote, you personally quote, multiplied by the tax rate. So everybody in the first, the, the first thing you would think is that everybody's going to assess a very low value to their property or their assets. But the, the, the trick with this cost um, mechanism is that when you quote, you self-assess and quote the value of your property, that becomes immediately a binding sale quotation. So the first incentive to quote very low, it's very compensated, totally compensated with the fear that if you quote very low, will come someone in the way and say, okay, I'm gonna pay that very low price and get the, the, the good. So it's an incentive to uh, really uh, assess uh, what you really value the, the asset. So uh, if this, uh, if you set it very low, uh, the asset uh, will end up in the hands of a person that most values it. So we get efficiency. Goods go to the to the person who's gonna give the most efficient use or who values the most, and that's efficiency. So in this way, the monopoly power of property is either eliminated or if you really, really want to keep your asset, you will have to uh, quote it as high that the rents or the, the, the excess value will be taxed away for the benefit of society. So we get more revenue for social expenditure or so on. So this is an idea or a, a mechanism that improve the allocation of resources and increase fiscal revenue. This is amazing for economists. Very few other taxes will, uh, will have this effect. Usually we say that taxes uh, are inefficient because they decrease the amount uh, traded in the, in the market. So this is music to my ears. But then you ask yourself a, a many, uh, and economists ask themselves, is all private property monopoly? And this is a discussion far from being solved. Uh, in the fish, let's uh, talk about a little bit about the efficiency. Do we have monopoly power on our house? Probably not. Our house is probably very like any other house in the neighborhood. So since there is a market price, you don't expect to get more than uh, the market price. So the, the, if there is a market price, you don't need cost uh, because there is a price and if, uh, but you can get a monopoly power in some cases. For example, if someone wants to build a, a high rise a skyscraper on the block, or a supermarket, then and all of the neighbors in the same block will have monopoly power because it's their house that they want, not a house. And uh, so they got all the, will try to increase their value. And in, in some cases, in many cases, the deal won't be 
then the, the project won't be executed because everybody will try to get the rent. And so the profit expected from the project it can uh, vanish very quickly with the money that they are asking. But if the neighbors had, before the project came, had uh, assessed their uh, house, they would have, they didn't, they wouldn't have had any monopoly power. They didn't have the information they, that their house was going to be so valued. And uh, the project would have been done because they would have sold at the price they really value or the price that were uh, in which they can get a, a different house in the next block. So, uh, and even in these cases of a uh, holdout or a uh, problem, there are, for some cases, there are other solutions, are there uh, lawful solutions like uh, eminent domain. So for projects like highways, transmission rights, railways, et cetera, there are, there are some uh, mechanism to give a market price and to uh, take away the property at the market price or what is estimated to be the market price. And though we don't need this cost mechanism. So probably what I'm trying to say is that not all properties monopoly, and in most cases, we will not have a whole problem in housing, cars, shares of a public firm, etc. And for revenue, we to the if there is a market price, we can just tax the the property at their market pr uh, price, and the, we don't need cost mechanism. Furthermore, uh, regarding a private pro property. We can ha face very hard political resistance because nobody wants to wake up and learn she doesn't own the apartment she lives anymore and have to move very quickly from there because somebody bought it at a higher price than she quotes. And uh, there are many other criticism, among them costs may induce to changes in the composition of assets and uh, held by people and they, that may be distortionary too. So there would be a lot of political problem, criticism on practical aspect of cost application and on more phil philosophical issues about the origin, origin of the value of property uh, that many of the people in radical exchange have talked about. So we, ask ourselves to which kind of facets uh, we have to apply in this idea. And here I tend to agree with the most virulent or vicious criticism to, to the book of Postner and Bile, which is David Levin's uh, critic, which I quote there, it's a review essay in the Journal of Economic Literature. And he, well, basically what he says, is that this is a very good idea for some uh, goods, but since the authors propose it for every asset, they, he's, they are like throwing the baby with the water because uh, instead of emphasizing when it's really necessary, they are trying to apply it to every kind of asset and the good idea is gets kind of drowned. I am not in total agreement with Levine since given that cost proposal has to be and has been improved uh, since the book was written. And Glenn Weil wrote a, a radical exchange in academic agenda and most of the criticism that Levine's uh, raises uh, are acknowledged that they need more research but I do agree that applying this mechanism to the location of public goods being the spectrum one of many, because he talks, I mean, both the book and the criticism of Levine talks about, uh, uh, about the spectrum, but there are more, more, much many more uh, public goods. Uh, that this idea is less controversial the monopoly problem is clearer 
and has fewer problems of implementation, and it's very, very necessary and very urgent. So cost becomes salsa. <laughs> salsa means it's very similar, but, but it's only to those rights that are licensed via auction. So it's self-assessed, licensed, sold via auction. So the, the idea is to allocate efficiently public assets, as, as I said before in the, the, the literal translation from Spanish, would be national goods of public use. So, uh, and those uh, goods are not private property, of course, they are uh, of public use. They exist a limited amount, so uh, they don't do not have uh, and they don't have substitutes, so they could constitute monopoly. Are, and what is very important, they are present in the production functions of many sectors in the economy. So it's urgent that efficient, uh, an efficient mechanism for allocation is applied. Uh, so, uh, and these companies that use them, uh, at least in Chile, use them for free, actually. And it's, it's salsa mechanisms would make us, make them pay us rent to the lawful owners of those um, assets. The only resistance, of course, would come from those that are holding the licenses for free. And we have had, and I am sure Diego remembers, uh, they usually claim that they are violating their private property rights when we try to suggest a new way to allocate them. And it's really a joke because they are a public assets. So how could they be private property? Only the right to use them are private property. So what are public assets? I tried to make a, a list, uh, but this list may be different in different countries because of the laws and what they consider public assets. So we have the, of course, electromagnetic spectrum. That's the, the, the example everybody has. And, and the electric magnetic spectrum is the, the space where the signals travel to uh, move this, the, this, the data uh, in both in mobile or, or wireless uh, telecommunications, radio, open TV, etc. So it's a very busy space, and physics do understand what, what it is, but I, I, I can make a picture in my mind of these highways, uh, and there are different highways. In, in a highway, it travels the TV signal, and in another one, the radio signal. And the important thing is that they travel in different highways because otherwise they're gonna uh, collide. What other public assets we have? Water, for example. And uh, this is a very hot topic in Chile because uh, we are uh, becoming a drier, dry country and the way to allocate water rights, it's very important. Airspace, air transportation rights, you cannot go, I mean, you have to have the permission of the other country to fly there and the way to allocate those rights, it, it's very important too. And we have protected bays, beaches, uh, strips of land, very important in Chile is mining exploration, mining exploitation, fisheries, aquaculture, clean air, and, and, and fin you, you can think of more examples and the handbook of local democracy that Radical Exchange uh, published give many examples at the city level. So why I was so worried being a judge uh, about public assets? Well, because the, the way the public, public assets are allocated is crucial for competition. In the extreme, if only one company holds the whole, the, all the spectrum, if only one mobile company holds all the spectrum, we are going to have a monopoly and we were gonna get high prices and poor service. 
But, so bad allocation is bad for competition, but even very good allocation will, uh, will not bring us perfect competition because there is a, these uh, goods are limited. So since they are limited, uh, there is a, a limit to the number of companies that can use them. So we are going to have a concentrated market. We are going to have excessive rents to the use of this scarce resource. And these uh, rents uh, should, be, should come back to us, the, the owners of those uh, assets. So uh, I, I'm going to, uh, OK. So we are going to talk about uh, the electromagnetic spectrum and allocation in Chile. But first, I want to, to make a very important uh, point that uh, most economists understand, most policymakers don't, and the, the industry that doesn't want to understand. This, uh, the, 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 the point is, even if we give away our public assets to, for productive uh, use, that doesn't mean that the service, these companies that receive our asset <coughs> will charge us as consumer a, a lower prices. Why is that? It's true, they got the, the, the input, called, in this case called Spectrum, they got it for free in Chile. But that doesn't mean that the, that input doesn't have an alternative cost. Of course it does, since you can sell it. So you receive it for free and then you can sell it. So if you can sell it, it has an alternative cost. So the, the product that uh, we are, we, the product that in need of that input won't be sold cheaper just because the input has, was acquired zero cost because the, that input can, can be sold at very high price. And that's the price that's gonna form the final uh, prices to the consumer. Uh, so how is this done in Chile? Uh, the rights are allocated through beauty contest for 30 years, easily renewed, so it's almost forever. And the company may sell the spectrum or sell the whole company getting rich, selling an asset that does not own. In Europe, uh, the allocation of the rights to use the spectrum are around 15 years. It varies uh, in different countries, but uh, it, in many countries with some year, a few years of notice, the, the government can take it back. For, many, for reasons of efficiency, of purely efficiency. That's not possible in Chile. Oh, it's not done in Chile. It's true that in most other countries, uh, they, they don't use beauty contests anymore. They use uh, auctions. So you would think, well, then the problem is solved, but it's not. It's not. In Due to many reasons, I, I'm going to cover a few of them. But in the book, what uh, the, the author says that uh, the price of the spectrum uh, or, or will grow with time as we demand more and more data to be uh, transported in this uh, spectrum. So the spectrum becomes scarcer, and it will be going to be more expensive. So those that got it in an auction, even if they paid for it, in 10 years, they would have done a very good uh, job if there is a good, very good business. If, for example, new technology arises or demand increases or new technology makes it, makes it more valuable. So what the, the salsa mechanism which is almost is the same as cost mechanism, is that 
it's a permanent auction. You probably got for X the your uh, spectrum, but there is with, with the change in technology and the change in demand in two or three years that uh, value has doubled. And since it's, if you don't have cost, if you don't have the obligation to sell it, you won't. And you will have that monopoly power compared to your competitors. There is a whole lot, a whole lot problem because uh, you need, as a company, as a mobile company, you need the, the spectrum to produce telecommunication, but it's very useful to raise rival cost or to keep rivals outside the market. So you won't uh, sell it unless you're forced to buy a mechanism uh, called salsa or cost or anything that forces you to quote the price. If you quote the price high enough, maybe you won't have to sell it, but you will have to compensate society for the monopoly power that you are getting. So it's, it's also it's a permanent uh, uh, auction. Why, uh, so what I say here is that even if technology or demand didn't change, the auction could have been badly run or could be a beauty contest, which is the worst run. And uh, so if for some reason there, are, there is more information and there is people or companies that value it best, salsa will be efficient even if there was an original uh, auction because uh, the, 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 maybe not all potential investors were aware of the bid because there was collusion, because the, the, words, the rules of the bidding were badly designed. For example, and this happened in the beauty contest every day, the, one of the, um, the requirements is to roll out the, the infrastructure really quickly and that's much easier done by the incumbents because they have already rolled out the, the towers where the antennas are gonna be put. So it's much uh, easier to comply with uh, deadlines. What I want to say now is not, is that the spectrum is not homogeneous. So it might happen that the object that is being auctioned in one moment of time uh, is complementary to other objects, to other spectrums that were licensed two or three or five years ago. So if that's true, only the incumbents are, will be interested in the new uh, spectrum that is delivered to the market because the rest, the entrants don't have the legacy or the kind of spectrum that was auctioned five years ago or that was released to the market five years ago. If we had salsa with this binding quote that the companies had to make, at least the entrants could buy those complementary assets and go into the market. Okay, so let's get a bit, a little bit technical to understand this complementarity. And this brain-like uh, drawings that I have here shows you how many antennas you have to roll out uh, in, a radium of, in a radius of 12 kilometers, depending if you have a band of 700 megahertz, which is low, or if you have a medium um, a band, kind of band, or you have a high one. So if you want to cover uh, this area and you have a low band, you will, have a, you will need only one antenna. If you have a very high band, you will need uh, 16 
uh, towers and 16 antennas. So you can see how much cheaper is to roll out the infrastructure to cover a country if you have low band uh, spectrum instead, or instead of high band spectrum. So hoarding, as I say, is very convenient to raise competitor, competitors' cost, but hoarding lower bands is even better. And so uh, this is the theory of why um, lower bands are more valuable, but we have uh, some data on, not very good data, but we have some data on prices paid. And for example, in Europe, we can see that coverage spectrum, which is called coverage spectrum is low band spectrum. So low band spectrum is around a 0.46 euros for megahertz for population. That's the, the measure. How much do you have to pay for megahertz and how much population you're gonna cover? So it's around 46, the median is 46 euros. And for the, uh, the, the, the capacity band or the higher band, the median band is uh, only point, uh, 10 cents of a euro. So in the prices, if this is not so beautiful, in the prices it's shown how that a lower bound, lower bands are much more valuable. This is a, a comparison for Latin American countries. And then we have a 0.3, three, I mean, 30 cents a dollar uh, for a megahertz in the low band and 19%, uh, 19 cents of a dollar for a higher band. So we conclude that both in theory and in practice, lower bands are more valuable. But uh, okay, I'm gonna in a, in a, uh, even in a beauty contest. I mean, if it would be an auction, the incumbents would be would be willing to pay more, and they would get uh, some monopoly power. So you rule. You don't you not only auction, but you decide you, you put caps on how much each company has uh, can have. The same happens with beauty contest. Uh, the, the incumbents have a, an advantage, not of money, but as I said, they can comply with the requirements more easily. So they usually get uh, the, 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 the object, even if they don't have to pay for it. And they are in an advantage. And they have the incentive to hard to increase a competitor's cost or rival cost. A, so it's a hoarding without punishment, without effective punishment, because the law says that if they don't use it, they have to give it back, or but we are in Chile. Okay, so where have we arrived with this system where we never get uh, we never try to even to uh, distribute the spectrum evenly. So we have actually four uh, mobile uh, companies in Chile. Forget the fifth one. They they got the the band only to hoard, so we won't talk about BTR. But we'll see that the comments are the first three, and they have uh, almost. Uh, the same amount of lower bands. And uh, although Entel has more medium bands. And then comes Claro and Movistar, those are the three incumbents. And then you have WOM. And WOM have zero of this valuable um, spectrum and has 60 of the medium bands. As you remember, that means they have to invest more. So how do we compare to uh, 
internationally. How to compare internationally? We, we built an index uh, of unequal distribution of lower bands or low, lower frequent, frequency bands. And you, you can see Chile is the third most unequal country in the distribution of uh, lower bands. This is very worrisome because Chile is a very, very long country and with very sparse uh, population. So to cover that population, we really need uh, this lower uh, band, this lower frequency band. So we did an exercise to see how much we are losing in inefficiency. So what we do, you see in this uh, graph, you see an orange line and a gray line. The orange line is, uh, shows the amount of sites or that you need or the amount of antenna you need to cover the whole country. And the, to cover the whole country with medium frequency bands. And the gray, line shows you how you can cover, how much does it cost to cover the country with a higher, uh, with a lower, I'm sorry, the gray is the lower band. It's cheaper. You need fewer stations to have, if you have a low frequency bands. So the, of course, the more, the more, I mean, going to the right, in any of those lines, the more spectrum you have, uh, the lower the cost of, of the lower the investment you need to cover the country. So we start from this point at 60 uh, megahertz of spectrum in the orange line. And that's the position that this entrant called WOM is today. So he has a very high cost compared to their competitors, the incumbents, that all of them has at least a 45 low in the lower band. So what we do here, first compare that uh, orange dot with the gray dot, uh, immediately below it, and we see that if one had uh, th those same 60 megahertz, but in the lower frequency band, band uh, th they would have 50% lower costs. But then say, okay, we, we think, okay, he doesn't have that, he just had uh, the higher band, 60 megahertz in the higher one, and what if we give them a 20 megahertz we take from the incumbent or we take from the reserve because they, they, there is reservation too, and we give him a one 20 megahertz of lower bound. And we see that the cost drops almost as much as if we only exchange the mid frequency to the low frequency and keeps only 60 megahertz for one. So to add to add uh, 20 megahertz would lower uh, their cost almost as much as if they had uh, only lower bands. And what is really interesting, interesting is that if we move from 20 to 30, it's got one change match. Or if so we can uh, say that a, an even, a more even allocation reduces cost for the system. I mean, if we take from the, from the ones that have a lot of uh, lower band um, spectrum, their cost won't uh, increase much, but if we give them to the one that doesn't have, their cost will, will decrease a lot. I mean, they're uh, decreasing returns. So it's really impressive, very impressive, how a company with such a poor endowment of spectrum was able to enter the market and 
to have a share, a market share today of 20% starting, and it, it started only in 2015. Not only that, it's really recognized, and I'm, I'm not going to show in much depth about it, but it's, it's a fact already in Chile that the entry of one lower market prices a lot, and, and not only that, but completely change the uh, consumer experience in the market. And that tell us how monopolized the market was before, and that could be disciplined by a very high cost competitor. So how this uh, affects our service in Chile? Let's see about speed. Here are the OECD countries and, and we can see that our speed is really low, even lower than Mexico in the 2017. I, I mentioned Mexico because it's a very uh, monopolized market there. And, and we only have a speed a little bit higher than Portugal. Uh, so we are the second, in this sample, we are the second least speed. How my, how, what the, the, then another uh, indicator of quality is the population covered by 4G technology and then again, we are the fourth uh, country with the least coverage for G in 1917. The GSMA, which is the, the representatives of the industry, of the mobile industry, of the world mobile industry, uh, build this uh, wireless core. And we see that in the, in, among uh, medium income countries, uh, Chile is among uh, the worst uh, in the score. And it's very interesting because then they run some correlations and they exclude Chile, which is an outlier owing to the late adoption of 4G, which depresses its wireless score. I mean, it depresses the wireless score because we don't have, we didn't have enough competition is not I mean, we're not an outlier and it's, it's, we're just a bad example, but not an outlier. The thing is that if they had put it, they couldn't show their, their one of the propositions that we're making. And for prices, we don't have a good data. This is a, 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 the national comparison. But the packages being uh, here, we have low users, medium users, high users, but high users have only two mega or two giga. I never, it's a very small package. So it's very outdated. It's, it's a very slow uh, data set to come out. So when it does come out, it's not useful anymore. So here we have Chile, just close to Spain. So we are in the, in the, in the area of high priced countries. But as I said, I don't give much credibility to this uh, data. So, and this is my last, uh, my last slide. So we, we, we have been talking about efficiency and we, have real problems with efficiency and with quality of service and prices and speed, etc. And we have problems with revenue since we are not charging these uh, users of our asset anything. So a very preliminary accrued assessment of, of fiscal loss due to, to not having auctions for spectrum is in the range of two thousand million dollars, more or less. How do I get that number? Well, with those median prices uh, I showed you, uh, for lack of average, I don't have the average prices for spectrum, I have the median 
and average in different parts of the world. So I use that price for Europe, for uh, United States, for Latin America, and I get a range between 1,800 and 2,600 million dollars. Uh, and how, how that compares to our revenues, this is around 35% of our annual revenue of value added taxes and 40% uh, of annual revenue of income tax. Of course, I am comparing flow with stock uh, because I, 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 what I did was apply the price to all the stock that we have in the market now and that stock and I'm comparing with annual revenue, which is a flow. But anyway, it tells you that there is room to decrease any of these taxes and, and, and keep and do the auction. And, and I'm just talking about the auction. And of course the revenue would be higher if we had salsa. I mean, if the price uh, or the taxes people, uh, the companies pay is increasing with the increased demand and the improved technology that makes the spectrum more, more valuable. So for not, for not auction, we have, lost $2,000 uh, million dollars, and who knows how much we are missing for not having this permanent auction, which is called salsa. Uh, so we have talked a lot about efficiency. We have talked a little bit about revenues, and I want to introduce a third concept just to finish this uh, presentation, which is dignity. I think for poor people or for most people, it will be much more dignifying to have a, a, a basic income or to have decent education and, and health paid by themselves out of the assets they own and not out of the reach that has to do that sacrifice to help us all. So I think it's much more dignifying uh, to, have to, talk, to subsidize what needs to be subsidized with, with our own resources and not feel that the rich are uh, giving it to the rest of the population. I won't say us because I'm not rich and I'm not poor, but us the rest of the world. And that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Diego. And uh, I am done. So I am having some audio problems, but uh, I will try to, to uh, keep moving on, on the... Can you hear me, Andrea? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me just fine? So it's yes. just me that I can hear you. So we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, and uh, well, first of all, thank you for this uh, very uh, interesting talk. Fortunately, I had already read it before because I kind of um, lost part of the, um, I think I lost the last couple of minutes. But so we have a question from the audience. We have, um, we have audience. Comments, do you think that even if applying cost, cost as an acronym to private property is impractical, it constitutes a sound critique of the justification of private property rights. So this is more like a conceptual question regarding if costs is kind of undermining the justification of property rights. 
I, I, I will give you uh, the three questions that we have from the audience in case my, no, no, no. my connection okay. Okay. Going, so if I so can, can you repeat the first one? Somehow I will, I will just go for but, the three questions that we have as of now. The second one is how can we draw a line between private and public assets and who decides whether a beach belongs to a city or a personal home? This is too like a conceptual, um, yes. a conceptual questions, and I, and I believe is what's the scope of salsa? I mean, how how can you uh, decide which kind of Diego. assets uh, Diego, I'm sorry. are going to be under the scope of the um, salsa mechanism? If, if if you were able to decide to to which as assets you you um, Include it, uh, and finally, how can oh, so those two questions. Uh, okay, uh, I think we have instructed to keep it short. They are so quite those, related. Those, those Andrea, I'm sorry that I'm yes. sorry to stop you. I, I know this is valuable content, but unfortunately, we are over time, so we do have to wrap up to go to the next. Just, presentation, uh, can you hear me? Okay, I will wrap up. I will wrap yeah, up. We, we must I start. can't hear you, so. It's, I, I will wrap up. I don't up. know what's going on with the audio. I think the, I the, the questions. Oh. Okay, great. Should should I answer? I I apologize. We we have.